Uh, they haven't got any pictures in it yet, as far as I know, but it's built beautifully. It's a beautiful gallery. Really? Oh, yeah, it's worth having a look at. No, I'd like, I'd like to see that, I must say. And uh, we've built a new great hall, Union Hall, place the old Union Hall since you've been gone. No, I haven't seen that either. No. Um, Anyway, we'll look. We'll look. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, well, I, I just uh, uh, Kevin or someone could take you around and show you Kevin Turnbull because there are a few things that we've done since you've been away. We built a, a, an accommodation lodge up there, which you could have stayed in. I'm, I'm really uh, uh, Jared's uh, away, so I haven't. Uh, had time to look up because it's the promotions time, it's the annual valuation for heads of uh, uh, units, and it's uh, uh, we've had a couple of changeovers of deans and professors, so I've been incarcerated in committees for the last three mm -hmm. weeks, you know, just morning till night. Mm -hmm. And you've got 5,000 people coming tomorrow, I understand? Yes, all that sort of thing, and uh, uh, anyway, one moment. Are you here tomorrow? Yes. Yeah. Well, would you like to come up tomorrow night? You'd be very welcome. Well, that's very, very kind of you. Is Gretel with you? Uh, no, no, she isn't, because no. uh, for one reason or another. But uh, uh, in the end, she decided not to come, because we, we can, are here on a working visit, if you like. Okay, well, both of you come up at uh, 6 to 7.30, that's, you know, with the house. Yes, that's very, yeah. very kind. So you said to pass on the kind of girls to you. She'd Lovely. like to see you and talk to you. Lovely. That, that's splendid. Here at the University of Wollongong, you hold as the Vice Chancellor position a great responsibility, a position you took up, I believe, in the early 1980s. And over the past decade, you have, as I personally observed as a former member of staff for eight years, overseen and guided a rapidly growing university with enormous energy, intelligence, and vision. And you're the first person I've ever said that to, actually. Well, I mean that sincerely. Thank you. <laughs> over the same period of time, uh, concurrent with your duties as Vice Chancellor, you were twice chairman of the Australian branch of UNESCO, and you've written two reports for the federal government on the marine environment, the last one just completed. And before that, you wrote a report, I believe, on the arts in Australia. And over the past 10 years, you've been party to the introduction of a wide range of academic courses and disciplines here, here at the University of Wollongong, Wollongong including a creative arts provision for undergraduates and postgraduates, including the visual arts, creative writing, drama and music. And I read recently you now have 1,200 1, overseas full fee paying students on campus, and that is remarkable. Now, it would be fascinating to ask you a number of questions on this whole variety of topics, but unfortunately time prevents this. Perhaps we could begin by discussing the environment on the one hand and the arts on the other. And if we do have time to explore one or two other topics, that would be a bonus. Now, in the context of the marine environment, and the report you just finished, it does put you in a very unique position to have a global view, and particularly when one considers you also chairman of the Australian branch of UNESCO. Are you optimistic about the, in the global environment in terms of the rapidly expanding population on the one hand and the finite resources on the other? I'm optimistic about human beings generally, and uh, I'm optimistic that human beings will rise to whatever challenge uh, faces them. And so, while they are profligate and indulgent when opportunity offers, they will in fact, I think, rise to the occasion, at least <coughs> a proportion of human beings. So, yeah, I think people have actually um, woken up to the environmental problems soon enough 
and uh, uh, that means that they will probably uh, be able to uh, master the problems. I don't, what it doesn't mean, however, and what I don't really subscribe to, is the, the kind of naive view that everything should be left as it is. Uh, I mean, I certainly think uh, one should preserve some of the rainforest, but I'm not one of those who says there shouldn't be any development. So getting the balance right and coping with what one does when you disturb the balance and put in results and all that sort of thing is the real challenge, I think, uh, not only Australia, but the rest of the world. Well, I mean, clearly this is a very important uh, factor in contemporary life. And it's very interesting that you are, are optimistic. Um, clearly, universities all over the world have a very important part to play in making people aware of any problems, not least environmental problems. Mm -hmm. um, would you say that, um, that there is enough being done to communicate the findings uh, from universities uh, and communicate those findings to the public at large, or do you think there's still a leeway to be made up? Well, by and large, academics are not all that good at, at communication, but <coughs> um, there is a growing realisation they do need to communicate better. And really, what you also have to understand, I think, is that uh, academics, by and large, work on one section of a problem, and uh, they are also, by training, people who shouldn't publish or write about or talk about a topic until they really feel they're totally expert in that topic and tie down every loose end. Whereas most problems in the world are multi-dimensional and require a, a solution today or some decision today. So politicians make those kinds of decisions on ambiguous information and multi-varied information and academics are by and large uncomfortable with that. And so for research to proceed, they want to take a long time, they want to do it thoroughly, and, and they want the, the answer. <clears throat> and, and the world actually demands different sorts of decision making, so there have to be some intermediaries between academic researchers, some popularizers, if you like, who also some policy makers who understand what the research will tell you, how far it will take you, so that the decision makers make good decisions as far as they can and realise that another set of decisions will be needed in another few years and another in a few more years, by which time, by the way, the researchers will have found out that what they already thought to be the truth is only part of the truth, and they found out a bit more. So that the whole thing is unfolding really all the time, and that total unfolding process is really one that is poorly understood, and that's why you sometimes get the view that academics don't do enough to communicate or uh, they're not popularizers enough and so they should do much more about it. But by and large, the process is working better in the late 20th century than it worked in the immediate post-World War II years when you know, scientists were thought to be boffins and boffins had to be listened to and they made as many mistakes as it happens as anybody else. And now you've got a more thorough understanding that it is partial knowledge, partial truth that we're getting to and that we really have to work our way through this and keep many, many things under control if we were to actually keep the world spinning in, in the right way. Well, what um, I observed when I was in Austria was that all news programs uh, included um, as a routine um, a science slot. Uh -huh. um, they also include an art slot. Mm -hmm. What was very interesting to me that the day that your marine uh, report went to federal government um, I switched channels uh, at the six o'clock new six o'clock news, and whilst Channel Ten mentioned your report had been received by federal government, the ABC didn't mention it at all, and that's not your fault. But on the other hand, it, it goes to show that where something which I believe of this import is made available to the government, it's something which the the ABC and I'm talking now about television. Mm -hmm. should, should, should pick up, because they must have had advance notice of that. Yeah. And clearly they didn't think it to be, at least on the, maybe they did it the day afterwards, but certainly on the, on the night, uh, 6 o'clock news, there was no mention of it, but in Channel 10, uh, at 6 o'clock there was mention of it. Does that surprise you? Yeah, well, I, I, actually it's uh, partly to do with, uh, with the uh, ill education of journalists, which is why we've got a school of journalism here, in an attempt to do something about that because most journalists only work on the, 
the the kind of uh, bulls against each other, goring each other. And if they're not goring each other, it's not news. So that if when that report came in, there was a room full of reporters there and there was. four television crews uh, in federal parliament, and they had quite a long time, about now, and uh, uh, so there was plenty of footage if they wanted to put it on the news. But the, the reason they didn't is because it didn't attack Senator Schott or it didn't attack CSIRO. It was a, a more serious attempt to explore what the issues are and what kinds of policies are necessary if you really want to get good marine mm. policy and therefore uh, uh, proper attention to the marine environment. And if it's, in other words, with our present set of journalists, if it's not Keating attacking Mahatia or Mahatia attacking Keating, it's not news. I.e., it's not news if the coastline is is really de uh, suffering degradation or something like that. That's a, that's a journalist problem and a newsmaker's problem, not a problem of the lack of uh, academics or anything else like that. And and here we, I was trying to get the notion, the old-fashioned notion of journalism, where you had people who were sufficiently well educated to write pieces where they explained to you not only what the event was, but what was behind it and what other considerations and how you as a member of the public really needed to take it into account. As a matter of fact, I was only talking about it Jim Hagen this morning and I said, and what I wanted to really to turn out was a Neville Carter's for every area of news, you know, somebody for arts and somebody for the environment and somebody for politics and somebody for health and somebody for education, who could write with the grace that Neville Carter's had with the kind of depth of, of uh, background that he had in cricket and music and, and generally be able to produce a quality that you just don't see in journalists today. No, that's very interesting. Anyway, it's something which I think perhaps Australia might give some consideration to, because the ABC, after all, is an, is an arm. It's, it's funded by government, isn't it? And in that sense, the, the Austrian model seems to me a very admirable one, because what it means to say is that whilst most people would turn on the news, uh, and in turning on the news in Austria, they, as I say, have to hear the latest information in, 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 in concerning science or the arts. And in that sense, they become informed, don't yeah. they? And, uh, and I think it's something which, uh, as I say, perhaps the ABC could look at to the benefit of uh, the yeah. decimation of love. Well, you know uh, Robin Williams, uh, the noted yeah. science commentator on the ABC, he was saying the other day that there are now something like double or treble the hours on, of science on the media that there were five to eight years ago, and that in turn was more than it was before. So it is increasing, oh, although sure. it's, it's underplay. Sure. But uh, sure, there's a lot more room for it, you know, than there was. Because you see, I think a specialist audience will look, say, at, at an arts program. What I'm suggesting is that the Austrian model is good because it means that the, the, the everybody who mm -hmm. looks at the news at all inevitably has to absorb this background information. And if I may say so, the, the, whilst there are given visual arts uh, programs, which are often very, very good, uh, the visual arts, by and the large, say, compared with music, uh, are not anything like as well rec recorded or um, provided for. Anyway, yeah, well, I mean, uh, while uh, that, that's true, John, but um, so there's some encouraging signs. I mean, I'm on, as you know, I'm on the board of the Sydney Dance Company, and the Sydney, da uh, the ABC the other day recorded a new program that Graham Murphy wrote especially for them uh, called Sensi. Uh, they put it on at such an awful hour. They put it on half past ten on a Monday night or something like that, graveyard stuff, but they actually spent a lot of money uh, creating and recording this stuff. Not so much for the visual arts, it's true, but uh, they are, and I mean, we, we, the company is talking to one of the other channels, one of the commercial channels, about a major event to be run at Uluru, you know, the Air yeah. Rock next year, the potential cost of about a million dollars, so um, they're, they're, they're projects one would never have thought of a few years ago. For sure. But what is very interesting to me is that I think it's the popular notion among journalists that, say, the visual arts is a subject which the average person isn't interested in. Now, what is very interesting is that I saw a statistic that 33% of all overseas tourists 
come into Australia do go to one of the, or other of the major public galleries. Oh, now, that's yeah. a very, very high percentage. Yeah. And, and what also interested me very much, going back to the late 70s, in Britain, the Board of Trade did a, a survey, and these are the sort of figures that came out. 8 million to 10 million, 8 million people went to live football. Um, something like 21, 22 million went to the theatre, and I mean all aspects of the theatre, yeah. including variety, this sort of thing. 40 million went to the galleries and museums, mm -hmm. and 44 million went to um, historic buildings. Mm -hmm. So it means to say a very large number of people are very much into using their eyes. Oh, I and, and what I'm really saying is, given that, then if you look at the proportion of visual arts coverage, say, in the media, mm -hmm. newspapers, it's virtually, virtually excess, except for the specialist newspaper, it's virtually non-existent, isn't it? Yeah, but it's been increasing. You take, uh, you take the Sydney Morning Herald. Ah, but that's, that's a good paper. Uh, and the Australian. But its, its coverage has increased on the arts. Yeah. In the last two years, uh, the back of the front section, they run about three pages every day on the arts now. It's, it's really incredibly incredible. Oh, oh no, I, I, I exclude that because from the age, the Sydney Morning Herald and the Australian, I think yeah. they do very well. Yeah. But when you come to the popular newspapers, and certainly oh, in Britain, again, the, no, no, the popular no, no. newspapers just yeah, totally true. ignore. And after all, but on the other hand, I think it's important to realise very often the popular newspapers cater for a very large percentage of the population. Yeah. So in that sense, oh, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a barometer, if you like, of yeah. how they perceive um, and value the visual. Yeah. Anyway, I think it's a little bit. Actually, I think it's a little bit like like reading, uh, where a lot of people bemoan the fact that uh, kids read a lot of comics, and so this is bad for their reading habits. I think it's actually good for their reading habits because most of us will read a, a serious book and then turn for a light reading to a, a, a crime or a light women to kind of those family sagas and so on and, and kids turn from reading heavy school textbooks back to comics. But that volume of, of reading entices them on because they, they then go on to more difficult stuff. I think it's the same with the visual arts, that if people can be persuaded to be interested in the visual arts, even if it's not the best pictures and the, the most serious art, but to get involved and started and regional galleries and exhibitions and school exhibitions and so on, then they will be uh, encouraged forward. I think yeah. it, uh, it will enter more into people's lives. Mm. Oh yes, I, I would accept that. Well, perhaps at this point we'd actually uh, focus our attention uh, on the environment of, of, the, of the Wollongong University campus. And first of all, perhaps we could uh, discussed some aspects of the external environment. Now, over the last uh, 10 years, you've taken a very active uh, role in how the campus has developed. I mean, I, I do know vice chancellors that don't even speak to their architects. Mm -hmm. um, now, that is something which is very dear to your heart, isn't mm -hmm, it? Mm -hmm, it is. And uh, there's been a, a great, a, a, well, a very large building program taking place. Uh, first of all, can I ask you, because, uh, is there a specific height uh, for um, the buildings on campus, or is that something which... Three storeys. Three storeys. We and decided that will be walk-up. Uh, uh, but of course the uh, disabled, disability uh, needs also came in, so we got less than them anyway. But uh, we were looking for a human scale. No, that, that, that's fine. Well, and of course, that's achieved. Now, um, the c clearly uh, on, on campus again, there is a need to provide not only buildings uh, which uh, meet specific functions. And you've overseen a period where many new uh, disciplines have been introduced to the mm -hmm. university, and each of those disciplines requires buildings and spaces. Um, but also, you make provision for uh, such as the uh, playing field here, the hockey pitch, which mm -hmm. I believe is to international standards, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. And that requires a prescribed space. Um, on the other hand, you can then get the sort of more natural environment, and that too has been a, a matter of concern to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, there's a, an artificial lake just outside this building, which you had uh, put in, there's a, there's a waterfall, and as you were saying before we were 
began this formal discussion outside the Hope Theatre. Uh, that's been considerably landscaped, mm -hmm. hasn't it? Mm -hmm. and, all, and all that's very much, I would suggest, your initiative, is that correct? Sure. Yeah. 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 We were working to a master plan. Yeah, yeah. And when was that master plan established? Well, in, I came here in 81, uh, about 80, late 82, uh, when we started to get a go on with buildings, we decided we needed a master plan, so we worked that through. and. We're pretty much stuck to it, actually. And now you're about two months too early because in another couple of months, when all that settled down and we've opened this building and cleaned up around, there's still a lot of debris. Uh, we'll have completed the first phase of, of the master plan as much as I hoped I would achieve in the time I was here. But we've left the we've left it in in a way which can be built on. Now you don't have to kind of. Uh, uh, put me major pieces in, you can add on so that the basic campus layout and style is well established. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's a very satisfying time. I take it that uh, car parking is always a problem because it, they need a lot of space, mm -hmm. and in that sense, uh, you've had a multi story car park built at yeah, yeah. uh, the other end of campus. Um, is there any way of, uh, of, of, of mitigating the starkness of a, of, of a car park, do you think? Uh, well, as you can see, we've got uh, the ordinary uh, tarmac car parks and the multi-storey one. Um, uh, well, with the multi-storey one, we've mitigated it just with some louvered sides on it and, and so on. Uh, it's less stark than it might otherwise be, but the other mitigation you can do is just grow trees around it and, yeah. and um, more or less hide it. Yeah. Uh, but perhaps you, I mean, what we were actually trying to do with this, what I was trying to do with this campus was uh, create it in a fashion that would be uh, a joy to live and work in. I was trying to bridge the, the cultures. Uh, but I think everybody who's, who's an engineer is likely to have an interest in, in um, uh, artistic things and uh, a nice environment and people who are artists and creative people on that side of the uh, event should be aware of the fact that there's a lot of science gone into the things that they use whether it's colors or anything else and uh, try to keep the campus we're also trying to keep the campus in size to a human scale so that people could talk to each other across faculties and we made a decision and I don't know if it was in your time not to expand beyond uh, 12,000 people on campus at any one time. And the whole notion of the way to develop the campus is a, is a planned disorderliness in a sense that we didn't have geometric shapes. We thought it would be fine to follow the contours and to do what a really beautiful woman does that's just slightly enhance the beauty that's already there mm -hmm. and not be violence to it by trying to sort of put everything in geometric squares and so on. So you won't see all of our buildings square edge. Some have got corners on them and some are round and, mm -hmm. and, and always trying to fit into the environment. And we've tried to keep the same architect uh, and he's been worked over so that he's pummeled or out of shape almost uh, by what we wanted and uh, uh, so that uh, we would get a few things that he didn't really want such as a fair degree of commonality of the style of the buildings so they looked as though they all came out of one overall plan. We tried to put the paths together and the lighting system and the way of getting a natural environment, a natural vegetation which fitted in with the surrounding vegetation so that all this would in the end come together. Within the framework of the idea that, or the realization, nobody was ever going to give us any money to create Michelangelo quality buildings or whatever. So we had to try and do the best we could with, with within the framework of the fact that you've got to get a certain amount of space out of a certain amount of money, which means you can't really very much embellish any building. Mm. With the possible exception, or the actual exception of the one we've just finished building, where we deliberately made one capstone building on the campus with an extra bit of money from the university itself rather than the government to say, well, here we are, we've got all these uh, sort of uh, utilitarian buildings, we've got one building that sort of 
pulls it all together with the pathways and the landscaping around it so that when people come on they would say, oh yeah, it's a really nice place and here, oh right, this is a vantage point to look over the whole lot. Um, now, there are a, a fairly major uh, sculptures in the in external environment, aren't there? And, um, uh, I suppose the first uh, Bert Flugelman sculpture was largely contingent on the generosity of BHP, who I believe provided for the, yeah. for the making of it. Um, for well, start. both the ones that Bert did. Yeah. Um, the, um, uh, the one that's like that, the, uh, I forgot mm -hmm. what he calls it. Gateway to Mount Kira. Gateway to Mount Kira uh, was largely uh, fabricated by uh, uh, boiler maker apprentices out of BHP and done with stainless steel which they provided. Yes, so that was kind of almost cost free and cost free work gave his services and his creative uh, impulse. Uh, similarly, the one up on the hillside, um, which uh, the flight yeah. uh, uh, sculpture, uh, I think uh, would have cost double the, I mean cost altogether about 350000 anyway, but I know for a fact that uh, lots of the people who work for Transfield, Franco Belgiano Nantes yep. people, yep. put hundreds of hours into this because he was joking to me about how hard it was to get his own fellows to work for him when they had this well, really interesting sculpture to actually work on. <laughs> well, that's very true because if I may just interrupt there, um, I actually did a, a number of drawings, yeah. one of which I gave to Bert, and I watched that construction taking place. Yeah. It was very, very interesting. Uh, the Transfield. That's right. huge sheds and uh, so that's a very interesting but it's also I interesting to me that uh, that again I've, I've often heard you remark that you you want external sculptures don't you yeah. as well we don't have enough actually I mean uh, the place is now ripe for it if we uh, I think you see the one that uh, we installed since you left the one that yes, commissioned yeah. with that yeah. prize yes, yes. Um, it really needs another half a dozen of those in strategic places around the uh, campus to draw the eye, to shape the way people look at things mm -hmm. and just in their own right as individually uh, interesting and beautiful pieces. Mm -hmm. But uh, they, they cost uh, a bit more money than we've got at the moment, so we have to acquire them, you know, arduously one by one. Yeah. What, do you, what do you say? I mean, there are always people that, that criticise whatever anyone does, whatever you do, whatever is done on campus, and not only on this campus, any other campus in the world. But what do you say to people who, who say, well, a piece of sculpture costs a lot of money, uh, there are other priorities in university, let's scrap the sculpture, let's go for the, the more practical uh, you know, requirement. Um, yeah, well, it's a constant battle. I mean, uh, uh, yes, the people who uh, feel that way, they, they very often feel like that for selfish reasons though, I mean it's, it's them and their wants versus uh, a decent piece of sculpture that's going to last uh, uh, well, for a lifetime and uh, for several lifetimes and be a permanent enhancement. So you have to walk a fine line between uh, providing uh, for the real, really day by day needs and these longer term needs. So my, actually uh, my policy is really to uh, I do as much as I can get away with, mm. as much as the community will, will tolerate, uh, knowing that they won't tolerate as much as I think is necessary. I keep on trying to educate them, I keep talking about what we're going to do next so that by the time we get to it, like children, they're mm. kind of expecting it. Uh, and. Uh, uh, generally, as much as I'm bold enough to do, uh, i.e. how much criticism I can take in any one time. Well, that's very interesting because I mean, if you take uh, Ghiberti, a, a Renaissance sculptor, um, he was commissioned to do the Baptistry Bronze Doors, which took him 20 years, mm -hmm. and so delighted with the guild that commissioned him, they gave him another 20 years uh, pay to execute the second pair. Now, that sort of attitude uh, was very common in the Renaissance, mm -hmm. and it seemed, and it also seems to be a, a characteristic of the Italian psyche. Mm -hmm. that they have this great regard for for the visual feel of things. Uh, th there does seem to be in our own age, and, and I think particularly as an Englishman, uh, I think there's a great sort of tradition and understanding of literature and drama mm -hmm. 
But when it comes to the visual arts, I think partly because of our puritanical background, mm -hmm. um, we tend to sort of move away from the visual arts. It wasn't so in the Henry VIII's court, and it wasn't in Charles the First court, but certainly it is today. Um, so I would say there's a degree of what I call um, uh, aesthetic illiteracy, visual illiteracy. Would you accept that as a... As a, 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 yeah, a, a there's, a, there's an over-emphasis uh, on uh, uh, money-making and being pragmatic and productivity and all these sort of things, and gross domestic product uh, as a measure of well-being and wealth, when in fact it's a measure of a certain kind of wealth, but not well-being. Yeah. And that well-being is measured by the balance of, of what you've got physically and what you do with it aesthetically. And so that, uh, I mean, what was really actually given to me to do here was freedom to kind of create something that represented as near as I could get in the late 20th century to a pattern of educating people both by courses and by the way that the, the campus shaped their way of thinking and lives, which is really a, a, a marvellous adventure. It's been a terrific I'm sure, I'm sure. A terrific yeah. adventure. You know, it's sort of, if you look around, one of the distinguishing features of this campus is there's no graffiti, external graffiti. Yeah. And that is astounding when we have 11,000 people running around us getting together with half the community because they use the, the uh, hockey field and the swimming pool and the halls and there are weddings here every weekend and so on. Uh, somehow it's contagious if you create a, a beautiful place and you keep talking about it to people and alerting them to how much it will only stay beautiful, beautiful if they look after it, that they begin to own it. No, sure. But also, I would argue from a fiscal point of view, that if you have a, a beautiful university campus, or if a country such as Austria, which has beautiful cities and beautiful mm -hmm. landscape and this sort of thing, and within those city complexes has a whole range of, of facilities, um, museums and this sort of thing, that in turn attracts people to come and they spend their money. If you take Australia, I mean, people are coming to in Cairns in their droves because they're attracted to the wide open spaces which are in Australia, which aren't very common in Japan, say. Mm -hmm. um, and they're also uh, responding to the natural environment. So in that sense, uh, the, 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 the campus such as this, it not only provides, it seems to me, good courses, but by providing a really uh, fascinating, visually interesting environment, that too can be seen as part of the attraction. Isn't oh, that so? absolutely. And I really think that that Wollongong ought to, ought to parallel what we've tried to do on campus and make Wollongong itself an attractive destination for tourists and, and that can be done and needs to be done in the modern world by, as you're suggesting, a combination of its natural attractiveness and this is one of the most naturally attractive places in the world together with man-made, human being made anyway, uh, 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 attractions in the way that even with limited money you can set out um, a square or build galleries. Now the regional gallery is starting to get a bit of momentum on. I don't sure, know if you've sure. uh, been to have a look at it. I saw it when it moved. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, he seems to be quite uh, okay. active. The yeah, fellow yeah. runs that. And uh, now we already get tourists come through this campus just to have a look at the campus. It's growing all the time. And I think you know this is such a this whole area of Australia is a lovely area. And uh, it's very hard at Townsville to replicate what you can do here quite readily. Uh, Townsville can't, but, and, and the campus certainly doesn't. And if, if you are touching on that, may I just say that uh, what is interesting to me, that Townsville a University campus is, is, I believe, the largest physical campus um, uh, in Australia. Is it? But what is very interesting to me, that they had an existing um, uh, uh, what was an uh, administrative centre, and they've just built another block adjacent to it. And instead of, in fact, having the two buildings like this, so that everybody would have views, what they've done is they've built them like this. So now you have, in what is this huge campus, very much like you get in New York, where people are actually looking out onto other office windows. Yeah. Now that seems to me, and it, 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 it again comes back to the priority people, was give to the, uh, the visual solution. 
and your counterpart, and I painted his portrait, and uh, I mean, I think he's a very in interesting, intelligent man, but the interesting thing to me is he doesn't talk to his architect. Mm -hmm. yeah, he well, talks I was to in that. I was in that building when I was there, in, uh, whenever it was, August, and I thought uh, how unimaginative that building was. And uh, I, that's why I'd like you to see the engineering building. Yeah, we'll see three or four old sheds yeah. and a piece of old building, and and we pulled it together and built an atrium over the top. And it's a lovely space. And the new block goes out. And it's a. I keep saying to the engineers, this is too good for engineers. It's too attractive, you know. But um, while I'm only kidding them, the fact is they. It really, I think. That's the sort of thing that shapes the way people will behave too. That if you if you're in a as you know, with music or if you're in a nice uh, environmental situation, you know, people are more calm and, and uh, relaxed. And it, I know for a fact that it is easier to make decisions in this university than in most. Because well, the people here are more tractable and, and yeah. sensible and less uh, given to displays of temper or outbursts of uh, temperament. No, I think it's very important because I, I think that uh, if you take, say, the visual arts, uh, the, uh, the academia has tended, uh, up until the very recent past, to exclude the visual arts. I mean, if you take in Britain, there were three universities, uh, say, in 1970, which had vision, a, a fine art facility. Yeah. One was London, one was Reading, one was Newcastle, and then there was the Royal College of Art, which wasn't really a conventional university, but was given university status, and that was about it. Uh, so in that sense, uh, there has been this sense of exclusion. Um, perhaps we can talk about what the implications of, of the situation when we finish, of how you perceive um, the, the, the visual arts developing now that most of them have been brought into the university system. But before we do that, perhaps we could just focus on the internal environment of, um, of uh, this campus.
Thank you. 
and you, you established a, uh, an advisory committee. You also set up a term, uh, the term of reference for how the collection to, uh, c uh, should develop. Would you like to say something about what those terms were? Because um, I remember very clearly. Uh, well, I mean, I, I uh, felt that, uh, again, you know, you know, you make a virtue of necessity in a way. We didn't have the money to go out and buy the established artists. Mm. We certainly didn't have the money to go and buy international artists. Um, and in any case, it was really rather uh, fun and uh, likely to be uh, successful that we should buy Australian artists, uh, not necessarily well-established artists, including, uh, of course, some from, from our own school, uh, so that we could build uh, an artistically attractive uh, uh, collection rather than a collection of high-priced names uh, whose pictures might not be their best pictures and therefore not necessarily the ones other than the fact they had a name that you'd want to have. So um, I'm very, uh, still very pleased to show people around the campus and say how we got various bits including, you know, the, the sculpture, the wooden uh, oh, sculpture yes, yeah. down there and uh, as you remember was done by one of your students, I think, yeah, so from, you're from the steel mm. yeah. And uh, I mean, I get a little kick out of uh, thinking how each piece was acquired and how uh, Sanguinetti uh, piece was acquired and how Howard Warner financed another piece which was stolen oh. by the way. Is that right? Yeah. And uh, so that uh, each little piece that we've got, uh, the fact that it has a little story attached to it, or a lot of them that I know about, uh, and the fun I've had discussing with uh, the commerce faculty about how they should put money aside and hire, buy some pictures for their uh, new building and uh, how that educative task of talking to people who wouldn't otherwise be interested, how that's come along, I, I find that really a lot of fun. And we, by the way, we should show you this new building. We built a gallery into it, a marvellous uh, crescent-shaped gallery with, uh, um, it's uh, about 15 feet, and again, we talk about architects, I have to really persuade the architects to reshape all their interiors, so we put a whole set of pictures on, on the walls, and we've been given a collection uh, online, uh, which Guy's got, of big pictures that they didn't have anywhere else to put. He says they're really nice pictures that whoever this collector was, he he, he bought big pictures and his home's not big yeah. enough for the pictures. No, yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen them, but Guy assures me that yeah. they're, uh, they're going to be good. So we'll have that in that new building too. No, I, well I think that's that's very interesting and should I come back? I look forward to seeing them. Now I just go back to this business, of, I mean, which I think is a, a, a very important point about say, buying the work of younger Australian artists. Because yeah. I think so often, you see, that in the visual arts, uh, you have to wait till you become firmly established before anyone recognises that you have any value. Mm -hmm. If you compare the world of the visual arts, say, with music, young musicians are being brought forward all the time, aren't yeah, they? Yeah. They're being encouraged to uh, enter into competitions, yeah, aren't they? Yeah. If a young dancer hasn't made it by the age of 15, yeah. uh, she's unlikely to make it at all, isn't yeah, that so? Yeah. So this idea of, of encouraging uh, a young artists is, is, I think, a very important one in its own right. I always remember very clearly going to the New South Wales University and they have had a uh, biannual dinner mm -hmm. and they arranged an exhibition of work Mm -hmm. um, and they bought two works, one for 10000 and one for 20000 mm -hmm. So that was not an unreasonable sum of money. But on the other hand, that sort of uh, purchasing policy is only valid if you have a very big collection. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now what is different, you see, if I may say so, between Wollongong and a lot of the older established universities is the, that up until now you haven't had a specialist gallery, which you've just been talking about. Mm -hmm. But what you have had is artworks in, a, in, in, the, in the working environment. Yeah. Now, that's fairly singular, isn't it? Well, I, I hope so. Uh, well, I don't hope that it's so, but I mean, I think that uh, the, the fact that we've got them there is a significant thing, and um, uh, it's, it's taken on. As you know, uh, a number of the staff came to you and said they wanted artworks when they saw that they could oh, have sure, them. Oh, sure, sure. And another feature of it that's nice is that the school now 
uh, the students of the school exhibit down in the uh, Illawarra Technology Corporation sure. building, which you, esta you yep. established the tradition, but they do it automatically now, and they sell some from there as, uh, you know, starting out students, and the uh, Long Gallery is still has had a nice run of exhibitions uh, and that you established has gone on this year under Liz, I think, Liz Yeah, Jenny. that's sure. So, uh, yeah, it's really nice now and uh, as you know, Barry Cunningham has just succeeded to the Vice-Chancellorship at the uh, Southern Cross University. Oh, so I heard, yeah. And part of the reason for that was that the name of the school uh, was so well known to people on the selection committee that Damian Kramer and uh, the Vice Chancellor of New South Wales and the Vice Chancellor of the University of Canberra all on there and I think Barry was a little bit uncertain about whether creative artists would ever be chosen as a Vice Chancellor. What did they you said, think, isn't They said, well, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, we've heard of your work, you know, the work of the school, meaning uh, that was their yeah. meaning. So, uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it, the name has spread because of all this sort of activities and uh, I think that's great. Oh yeah, I think Barry actually got it. Yeah. Uh, as he walked out the door, you know, he sort of, he one of his parting lines is to say, well, you have a unique opportunity to be an absolute first in the world to point a creative artist as well, a vice that's chancellor. Now, is, 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 is just very briefly, is, is that perception of the creative artist uh, deserved? I mean, is, is it, so, I mean, for example, um, the Austrian architect Adolf Luz at the turn of the century, are we okay? Yes, yes, sure. Um, I've, I've made the point that um, of art activity, um, that's say the production of painting, uh, was the activity either of, of a retarded child or, or, or a lunatic. <laughs> um, and th th though, though you smart, there was a lot of currency given to that among um, architects. I mean, architects very often would, t would take the view that any embellishment inside a building, still also outside a building, was a corruption of the, the, the concept of something that was pure form determined by function. Well, um, I think that kind of precious arrogance has, has gone from many fields now. There was a time when scientists, as I said before, believed that they were in possession of the truth. And now we know they're at best in possession of a portion of the truth, the, of what I call a tangential blow at the truth. And so somebody's going to come along and show them that there's more to it or that it's actually different. And so people are less, um, are less, uh, what shall I say, certain that they know the answers and therefore they're less willing to be uh, do, uh, dismissive of artists in various ways. They, in a way, they, the scientist more understands that a good scientist is really an artist, is exploring, as an artist is, where the truth lies. And so is an artist exploring where the truth lies uh, in a different way. Mm. And there are different ways of knowing and people are better, more understanding, especially because of uh, multicultural influences where people know perceive that there are different ways of, of knowing about relationships, of, of perceiving the actual r reality of the world and, mm -hmm. and, and representing what that reality is, so that I, in th on this campus in particular, there isn't really a problem. I've not mm -hmm. seen uh, any visualised uh, uh, rubbish by anybody else on campus or them vice versa, there's a kind of a, just a clean, easy acceptance of each other mm. and a, an appreciation of the richness that this brings to the campus, which um, I think every, nobody would do without it. And I mean, two examples of that are, first that uh, Barry was elected uh, uh, chair of the Academic Senate, mm. the chief uh, mm. policy-making body for academic uh, matters on campus, and second, it's just been uh, accorded individual faculty status, where it was a subset of the Faculty of Arts, where from January 1st is to be an end of a faculty in its own right, which wouldn't have happened if uh, academics hadn't been comfortable with its standards and its uh, its ways of doing things and the rigor of its requirements and and uh, and so on. So I think uh, th that that's a really a good step forward. Now. I was very keen about that because another of the um, underlying 
threads of what I was trying to do here was that I felt that when I first came to the university in 1981, that creativity was a very much underplayed part of academic life, that people would give you a PhD for criticizing things uh, and analyzing, but not synthesizing and creating. And that's the more difficult task, mm -hmm. that it's relatively easy to pick something and pick it apart. Yeah, yeah. It's not so easy to, to, to take elements and put them into a new hole mm. in a way which is uh, aesthetically pleasing or even utilitarian for that matter. And, mm. and so uh, having a school of creative arts was one of the things I had in mind right from the beginning as a way of, of uh, yeasting through the whole place and trying to get the emphasis on the creative side of, of uh, people's lives. No, well that's very interesting because the, the last point I would just wish, wish, wish to touch on I mean, historically speaking, uh, in, in England and Britain, um, there's been uh, a development whereby, first of all, art colleges were phased out and, t and put into polytechnics. Mm -hmm. And now, more recently, the politics have been turned, more or less, all of them into universities. Mm -hmm. So you've now got this visual arts provision within the context of the university, which, as I said earlier on, in 1970 wasn't the case at all. And in Australia, you have a very similar situation, don't you? When, um, Dawkins, in fact, encouraged the Sydney Arts Institute to go into New South Wales, yeah. Sydney College of Art went into Sydney University and so on and so forth. And so that has now become the established pattern throughout Australia, hasn't it? Yeah. So th that is presumably a pattern that which has existed here for 10 years or so, which you would presumably um, welcome throughout Australia. Well, we probably preceded most of uh, most of what happened uh, in Australia in that uh, sphere. I suppose you, I mean, one has to confess at the end of the day, John, that really what I was doing was entertaining myself as as, as much as anything else. That uh, uh, I get a lot of fun out of uh, dealing with the creative arts and creative artists. I mean, you're all a little bit uh, uh, eccentric and. Uh, idiosyncratic and, and different. But I find that's a lot of fun to deal with people who look at the world through different eyes and who force me to look at it through different eyes by talking to me in a different idiom mm -hmm. and with different expectations of my response. And so I was always delighted to work with you and everybody else in the School of Creative Arts and it enriched my life to have that happening uh, just as it does when I go down and talk to the engineers and the scientists who enrich it from a different point of view, so that one, having all this array, is kind of being paid to have a lot of fun. And so that was uh, that was as much, uh, I suppose, I mean, if I was honest, I, uh, that's as much my motive as anything else. And, and it's the same on the campus. I mean, I was given a kind of uh, opportunity to build a monument uh, to the sort of things I was interested in. So uh, off you go, and you're always limited by money, and uh, always takes longer, and never turns out exactly as you visualise it anyway. I don't know if that's true for an artist. Oh, but, sure, sure. Um, so you keep playing around with it and doing a bit more, and lo and behold, you've got at the end of the day something that's really quite interesting and uh, a lot of fun. And what's interested me, by the way, is how much the campus community is on, on side now. And you know how much trouble we had with the first things? And now people say, oh, I see, we've got some more ponds. Well, isn't that lovely? And then you hear people go around and they say, oh, we have a beautiful campus. We're so pleased to be working at Wollongong University on the campus. And then when we are, the other day we turned on these new ponds and even just down, I had two messages on the email saying, ah, oh, they great, Vice Johnson. Yeah. Seven or eight years ago, people said, what's he doing spending all that money know, on that? I remember it very clearly. And now mm. people think, oh, that's terrific. So, uh, you know, you do get the reward out of it. You do get people who, who sort of, it's the same with the buildings. Mm. And I get a lot of people who come here who say, gee, you know, you're lucky, you've got terrific, you've got all this terrific art around. Mm. I say, you'd be surprised how little it costs. It's just a matter of having an eye and having, having an interest in it. And, you know, we're lucky having... You know. Well, I think, may I just say, I think it's very important because one thing that Guy Warren was saying, that the during the Depression in Sydney, you had uh, a, a problem. A, a lot of galleries went to the wall and so on and so forth. And that would be uh, true in, in uh, 
Europe and certainly in Britain and England. Uh, therefore, it is absolutely important that universities shouldn't be making the sort of provision that you're talking about, not mm. only being patrons, but providing spaces where they can exhibit mm -hmm. as an alternative to many galleries which have ceased to exist. So I think that's very important. And be it, making it part of their lives. I mean, that, so that when the engineering student walk around, they see pictures and they think, well, that's part of your kind well, of environment of you had. Isn't it? But and it's you have music and you have yeah. art and you yeah. have nice conversation, you have debates, and this is how you create for yourself a, an interesting life. Mm. And, and the same, I mean, when we had the, another sort of trivial, I suppose, when the students were grumbling to me about uh, all the papers around, and I said, well, who, who, who put the papers around? Mm. And they said, well, students. And I said, well, who should pick them up? You know, what would you do at home? Mm. And now I can talk to students in a way which is really, really interesting. I don't have to go through that routine with them. I can say to them, now, what are we going to do next? You know, and they say, oh, well, why don't we do this, Vice Chancellor? Mm. And they're with, you know, they, they, they've got a bit of a growing tradition uh, about having art in their lives, having interest in music, having a knowledge that are living in a nice environment generally, uh, which is environmentally sympathetic and, and, and pleasant buildings to be in, uh, is good. And I, I really should say a, a word or two about our architects too. Having, we made a deliberate decision to keep the same architects and uh, Graham Bell and Barber, yeah. in particular Terry Graham. And they have, because of that, they feel they own part of this canvas. This is their their canvas too. Yeah, yeah I can appreciate that. No, and, yeah, and and because yeah. of that, yeah. they share with us a concern yeah. for getting the buildings right, getting them to feel light and workable, and not skimping on yeah. on corridors and making dark corners. They haven't got everything right, uh, and they know that. And I give them lots mm. of unmerciful comments about what they haven't mm. got right but I mean one has to be generous they've made a huge difference and a lovely job of this campus and so you know we, we, I think I'm, I'm, given the amount of money we had the limited amount of money for the extent of the building we had to do I feel very pleased with what we're getting out of it now. Well anyway may I say that it's been a great pleasure talking to you again it's been a great pleasure coming back to this university uh, and uh, Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you for your part, and I have to say, John, that uh, your work as uh, uh, setting up the collection and, and getting it taken through the campus has been extremely significant in, in bringing about this atmosphere on the campus of, of respect for and enjoyment of art and contributing to the general sense of the campus being an aesthetically pleasing mm. place, and uh, I've always been grateful for your work in this, and I think well, you've established mm. absolutely the finest traditions. Mm. Well, it's been my pleasure. Anyway, once again, many, many thanks. Okay, that's good. Cheers. Well, let me take you over to this building. I'll show you this space just so that you get an idea. You coming, Christopher? You can pick that up in a minute.